Good afternoon. This is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. Welcome to our next live stream, which is thoracic outlet syndrome and EMG. This is a question we get quite often from both doctors and patients, and I'm glad to discuss it in some detail. But first, I want to ask all of you a favor. If you haven't subscribed to us yet, please subscribe. That helps our reach. Hit the button for subscribe, and then next to it should be a bell which will notify you every time we have a new video coming up. And then hit like, that'll help us a lot. These algorithms we have no control over, but we count on you folks to help us spread the word. We need to get to a thousand subscribers to get to the next level of freedom on YouTube so you can all help us. And finally, make comments, ask questions, follow the videos, all the interaction we get, as you probably know, helps <coughs> helps pay it forward for other TOS patients. So again, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. We're here in beautiful Sunnyvale, California. We've had some rain today, but otherwise we're finally starting to get spring. And I hope you all are as happy as I am about that. Today's talk is thoracic outlet syndrome and EMG, and let's roll right into it. Two components <coughs> of this study, EMG called electromyography and nerve conduction studies. I'm going to take them in order. They're usually done together, by the way. A doctor who does these is usually a neurologist, sometimes a neurophysiologist. It is a separate specialty. Many of those doctors consider these tests an extension of a clinical examination. So electromyography is the first category. EMG, electromyography, records the electrical activity in muscles. EMG can distinguish muscle disease from nerve disease. And just so you know, there are various types of nerve diseases, things ranging from trauma where a nerve is lacerated or actually transected to nerve diseases like Guillain-Barre syndrome. And these nerve diseases cause changes in the muscles that they serve. So by definition, these nerves are motor nerves or motor nerve fibers. We'll go over the anatomy of a nerve a little bit later I'll make these terms more clear. EMG can also provide some secondary evidence of peripheral neuropathy. And EMG, I'm sorry, uh, TOS is one type of peripheral neuropathy. Now, the way this is done is the person who's examining you, usually a technologist under the supervision of the neurologist or neurophysiologist, will take a special kind of needle called a concentric needle or coaxial needle, and they'll insert it through the skin into a muscle and then advance the little central filaments and start recording just little groups of muscle fibers. You can look for spontaneous electrical activity when the arm or the other muscle that you're studying is at complete rest. Or you can ask the patient to minimally contract or forcibly contract their muscle and see what happens. Abnormal muscle activity can be caused by either abnormal muscle, there are diseases of the muscle itself, or an abnormal or injured motor fibers of the pertinent peripheral nerve. Now, most nerves are made of several types of fibers. We're going to go into this shortly. First, I want to show you what some of these needles look like. If you look at the top example, there's a zoomed in circle, and it shows you that there is actually a sleeve, a stainless steel sleeve, or a cannula, and inside it will be some insulating material, and then the central filament, which can be advanced out of the cannula into the muscle. In this way, you have a pathway for electricity to go from one pole to the other. There are also monopolar needles. We're not going to dwell on the technical aspects, but I wanted you to get an idea of what these needles look like. Just a close-up example. Usually there's insulating material between those two metallic components. Here's a picture of some needles before they're used. And this is a picture of a technologist trying to find a specific muscle, recording the activity. And you'll also see these little surface electrodes or pads with wires that can record activity. All right, next, the second part is the nerve conduction study. So in this case, you would apply a small stimulus, or plural, you apply small stimuli to a peripheral nerve, 
and you record the responses of that nerve or the responses of the muscles attached to that nerve at another point. You get a nap. Don't worry about these terms. Uh, a nerve action potential. It's a little electrical wave that travels down the course of the nerve and can be recorded farther down the nerve at a distance from the initial stimulus. Secondly, there's a CMAP, compound muscle action potential. Again, this is electrical activity caused by activation of the muscle fibers. So nerves actually have kind of an electrical chemical reaction where they store ions of sodium, et cetera, in certain compartments. And when channels open up and allow those ions to move, it's an electrical charge or an electrical wave traveling through the nerve. There are similar changes that go on with muscles, and that's why you can record electrical activity. So this is a typical diagram of a nerve cell. <clears throat> In the top center, you see the nerve cell body. And from one side of it, you see this long process. Often this could be three, four, or five feet long, called an axon. That's an important term to remember. The axon is this long branch. It can go out as a sensory nerve and have a receptor at the end that picks up heat or pressure. It can be a motor nerve, which transmits signals to muscle at the end. And you'll see around that axon, here's another important term to remember, a myelin sheath. This is a fatty tissue created by specific types of cells and it insulates the axon. You see little tiny spaces between called a node of Ranvier. But basically, those electrical waves are transmitted in those little intervals, those nodes. The fatty myelin insulates the rest of the axon so the electrical activity doesn't leak outside the axon. Instead, it transmits down the axon. This helps insulate the nerve, helps protect it from damage, helps increase the speed of a nerve impulse. So remember axon, part of the nerve cell, often much longer than this. And remember the myelin sheath. Some nerves have myelin and some don't. Now, here's another diagram, a cross section of the spinal cord with nerves coming out. If you look at the top left, it says spinal, <coughs> spinal nerve. It's just a nerve. But you'll see coming out from it, a myelinated nerve fiber to the left and an unmyelinated nerve fiber. These nerve fibers are often mixed together. They're usually hundreds or thousands of these nerve fibers, which are really axons traveling down a nerve. And lower right, you see a cross section. It's just a diagram, but it shows mixes of these nerves with the feeding blood vessels. Here's a more uh, precise medical illustration showing hundreds and hundreds of nerve fibers or axons <coughs> going down a typical peripheral nerve. Some of these will be myelinated and some of them won't. Some of them are motor nerves, carrying impulses out to the muscles. Some of them are sensory nerves, picking up various types of sensation. And another type is called an autonomic nerve. That's an unconscious pre-programmed nervous system that does things like control blood pressure, sweating, blood flow to parts of the body. Now, here's a diagram of what I was talking about before. On top, you have a myelinated nerve fiber on the bottom you have an unmyelinated nerve fiber. Look at the unmyelinated one first. You see these charges carried by molecules or atoms within the nerve. And when they are released through the nerve membrane, they create waves of electrical activity, which travel down the nerve. You can see that the top one now, the myelinated nerve, only allows that to occur in these little tiny spaces between the myelin sheath. So it makes that nerve conduct much faster. Here's a micrograph of a myelinated nerve. And you see these dozens of layers of fatty tissue around a nerve axon, the long part that transmits the signals. If you look at a different one, you see a densely myelinated axon. But next to it, you'll see unmyelinated nerves. They do have supporting cells around them called Schwann cells, but they don't have this fatty coat. So for that reason, they're less protected, they have different functions, they transmit more slowly, this will be important. So 
as we've seen in those pictures, peripheral nerves in your body may contain many, many nerve fibers of different diameters, different degrees of myelination, and afferent or efferent, meaning going out from the central nervous system or coming back to the central nervous system. Efferent means out, afferent means back. Nerve conduction study, this is very important, studies only the fastest 20% of these fibers. I want you to remember that. Nerve conduction velocity. It's the speed at which this electrochemical impulse, or just picture it like a signal, how fast does this signal travel down the nerve fiber? Very importantly, nerve conduction velocity is primarily determined by two factors, the diameter of the nerve fiber and the degree of myelination of the nerve fiber. So a larger diameter nerve fiber moves faster. The impulse travels faster. And a myelinated nerve fiber travels faster. The impulse travels faster. So large myelinated nerve fibers tend to be motor fibers and they carry signals to the muscles. Whereas sensory fibers tend to be unmyelinated or lightly myelinated and smaller diameter. They also tend to be, <coughs> the nerve fibers tend to be distributed unevenly. A lot of smaller fibers at the periphery of the peripheral nerve where they may be more prone to compression damage. So nerve conduction studies, you typically do these three things, a motor nerve conduction study, a sensory nerve conduction study, and something called an F wave. We won't spend a lot of time on that. The motor nerve conduction study. Remember, this is for motor nerves. They tend to be large and myelinated. You place a recording electrode at the muscle of interest. So we know that the median nerve will go to some of the muscles at the base of the thumb. You might place a little pad to the skin or even maybe a little needle into the abductor pollicis muscle. Doesn't matter which muscle it is, but you know that it's served by the median nerve. Then second step, you stimulate an electrode that's placed over the nerve that goes to this muscle. So at the wrist, you might place a little pad over the, this part of the wrist right here because the median nerve will travel through a tunnel right underneath here and it'll go to these muscles among others. And the third step is when you stimulate that nerve with little electrical currents, you end up with a compound muscle action potential. The muscle responds and gives off electrical signals. All right? <clears throat> then what you do is you start increasing the stimulus at the wrist. And every time you increase it, you'll get an increased compound muscle action potential until you get to a certain point called supramaximal. At that point, a stronger stimulus will not generate a stronger response from the muscle. So it's called the supramaximal point. That's the type of stimulus you want to use. After that, you take that, you record what's happening in the muscle. Now you move an electrode maybe up here. And now you send a stimulus down and it will take longer for that to get to cause the CMAP, compound muscle action potential. But what you can do at that point is you use the difference between two or three of these stimuli and responses. You calculate the time difference, you measure the distance between the stimuli, and you can calculate how fast that nerve is conducting impulses. Okay? Sounds a little complicated, but it's good to understand some of the basic approach to this. All right. <coughs> that was motor nerve. <coughs> Please remember motor nerves tend to be large diameter and myelinated. Also remember that these, I'll get to this later. Let's go on to the sensory nerve conduction. What you do here, and again, this is nerve conduction studies, but these are the sensory type. You get what's called a SNAP, a sensory nerve action potential. Fancy words, it's just that electrical impulse that generates a wave of electricity down the sensory nerve. So what you do is you stimulate the sensory nerve in a peripheral nerve at some point, and you record this snap, this electrical wave, 
at a different point along the nerve. You can do it in one of two ways, orthodromic or antidromic. Orthodromic means you follow the normal direction of the sensory nerve. So normally there are sensory nerves in your finger that go up through this tunnel, up your arm towards your brain. Okay, if you start here and you record here, then you're going to get an orthodromic picture or snap. If you start here and stimulate and you see what happens here, that's going against the direction of the sensory nerve. It's called antidromic. And both are used for various types of peripheral nerves. And what you do is you calculate the velocity by looking at the peaks, this muscle, uh, sorry, nerve activity will send an electrical wave and give you a quick peak. So you just measure the time between those peaks and the distance between the electrodes and you get a nerve, <coughs> excuse me, a nerve conduction velocity. Now, F waves, I want you to picture, go back to that motor nerve conduction study we did. You take a large peripheral nerve with big muscle motor fibers in it, and you send a stimulus to the muscle at the end and you record that stimulus. At the same time, there is another impulse going backwards through that motor fiber up towards the spinal cord and the brain. It gets to the spinal cord, it hits some of those motor nerve cells, and a very small number, about 2% of them, will trigger and send a small, weak impulse back down the nerve. Okay, kind of complicated, it's just kind of little echoes. The uh, problem is that about two of these, 2% of these cell bodies that are hit in the spinal cord with a little wave, only about 2% will send one of these small impulses down the nerve. And each time you do this, it's a different population of nerve cells that respond. So it's variable. It's used mostly to look for <coughs> timing, a delay in how long it takes the impulse, no matter where it comes from, but how long that second impulse hits the muscle and gives you a second compound muscle action potential. If it sounds complicated, it is. It's kind of diffuse once it gets to the spinal cord. It can spread up and down a few levels. It's not very specific, but it does get a, a big picture of the entire length of this nerve because you can imagine that a nerve that starts in the spinal cord has to come out through the holes in the spine, through the thoracic outlet, and down through several tunnels in the arm. So it's hard to get needles or pads up here. So it does give you a picture of what's happening more proximally along the nerve. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these F waves. Don't worry about the crazy uh, long story of how the impulse gets around. So now I want to get to the point of what value do nerve conduction studies have? So they can determine when there is a disease affecting the axons. That's part of the nerve cell. It's a long cable or wire that communicates with a muscle or nerve at the end. It can measure diseases affecting the myelin. If that myelin sheath gets damaged, then the nerves won't function properly. And it can also help you locate where a peripheral nerve lesion occurs. You can find normal and abnormal areas and you can narrow down, if you know your anatomy, where the likely spot of damage to the nerve is occurring. Okay, so nerve conduction studies are part of the whole EMG thing. They look more at the nerves than at the muscles, and they can look at the axons and the myelin and sometimes help you localize a nerve lesion. Let's use an example here. Let's say you do this study on a patient who has loss of axons. So some of their motor fibers have damaged axons. The nerve conduction velocity will remain normal because there are still some normal motor fibers but the compound muscle action potential, the reaction of the muscle will not be as strong as normal. So you know that some of those motor fibers are damaged, but some are not because the velocity is still the same. Another example, let's say instead of the axon being damaged, you damage the myelin around a motor nerve fiber. Now, the velocity down that nerve goes less fast. Remember what we said, the myelin insulates and it helps speed things along because it doesn't let those ions leave the nerve cell, except at those small nodes. So what happens is you damage the myelin 
And now that wave of transmission starts fading and it slows down. Muscle strength may remain normal while this is occurring, by the way. Let's take example three. You have a peripheral sensory nerve and you get loss of those axons. Again, these are the long wires that come out of each nerve cell. So now what will happen is that snap, that electrical wave that you record with your recording electrode, that is smaller because you've lost some of those nerve fibers. Let's take the same sensory nerve and say this was a lightly myelinated sensory nerve, but we've lost some of the myelin. Now what happens is, again, you get a smaller wave or snap, but it also is prolonged. It doesn't rise and drop as fast because the velocities in some of the fibers are slowed down. So it's blurring the whole thing. All right. Now we're going to talk the meat of the matter, understanding some of the underlying basics. What are, what are the values of EMG and nerve conduction studies in patients with TOS? I'm going to do these as a question or a point and an answer. Number one, point number one, EMG is focused on motor nerves and muscles. So motor nerve fibers are large and they're myelinated and they tend to be centrally located within these peripheral nerves. So damage to those occurs usually after there's damage to lots of sensory fibers, which means late stage TOS. I've said it before, I'll say it again. By the time you get atrophy of the muscles in the hand is most common for TOS. By the time you get there, you've had so much nerve damage, it's much less likely that you will have a complete recovery. So we don't wanna wait until we see this. We do not wanna wait till we see motor nerve damage because that means it's been chronic and severe. All that time you've been getting the sensory nerves at the periphery crunched and you're getting symptoms, various types of vascular deregulation, color changes in the hand, pain, tingling, burning, numbness. You've been getting that all along before the motor nerve gets damaged. So. One of the things that's changed from 25 years ago to now is we don't see as many patients in this later stage. We're making the diagnosis more quickly. A lot of that is thanks to patients spreading the word and the fact that we can access such great sources as Google. Nerve conduction studies are focused on peripheral nerves. And this is true. The problem is that neurogenic TOS, the type of TOS we deal with and that is the most confusing and challenging uh, is really a larger complex bundle of nerves. And so when you study the peripheral nerves, you're just not seeing what's happening with the brachial plexus and you can't get up there very easily. You can't put pads and electrodes and needles in here very easily. So you have to get this secondary kind of evidence. Nerve conduction studies will only measure the fastest 20% of nerve fibers, okay? So you have a peripheral nerve, you have motor nerve fibers in there. 80% of them are not evaluated. Or you do a sensory conduction study. Only 20% of those are being assessed. And oftentimes, the small and myelinated ones are not being assessed at all. So sensory nerve damage in these complex nerves is just often missed. Nobody wants to do a test where you look at 20% of the question and you ignore the other 80% of the question. And unfortunately, that's what a nerve conduction study is limited to. And these are the points that I make. All right, F waves. When you do an F wave, it's this reflected wave that goes back up towards the spinal cord, rattles around a bit, and heads back down the nerves and gives you a small compound muscle action potential at the end. Again, only 2% of the cell bodies in the spinal cord respond. It's a different population each time. Really, this is, you know, it goes through the brachial plexus, which is five complex roots and lots of branches. So F waves don't really help. All right, let's take a look at three more. I'm going to take these one at a time. The components of the brachial plexus are larger and more complex with a greater mix of nerves than are the peripheral nerves. So when you look at this nerve, the median nerve in the carpal tunnel, it's a pretty small nerve. It may have hundreds of nerve fibers, but not thousands like are up here. So it's easier to find abnormalities. I don't know if anybody knows what this is. This is a section of one of the first transatlantic telegram cables. 
But you see, if you look at the cut end, how many loose wires are in there. Take a look at this. This is a one that came out a little bit later. Or look at this one. This is a modern cable, transoceanic cable. Now, suppose you were in a submarine and you dropped a clamp around this cable and you recorded an electrical signal. You would get one wave. It would be a very complex wave. Imagine trying to separate out what each one of these nerve fibers or wires is sending and receiving. It would be very hard because of all the background and all the mixed signals. So as you go to a more complex nerve bundle, like the brachial plexus, it's a lot harder to figure out what's happening than in a simple peripheral nerve. Now, another thing is that EMG and nerve conduction studies are performed in a standard posture, okay? What we want is we wanna duplicate where you get your symptoms. So we all know that TOS is a disease of reaching. Dr. Newkirk said it, Dr. Jenkins said it. It's a postural disease as much as anything else. We have some narrow tunnels, but we make them much worse and we stretch or compress the brachial plexus with movement of the neck, shoulder, arms, even our posture upright. And EMG and nerve conduction studies are not done that way. So we're losing some sensitivity. This is important. There is no reference standard for neurogenic TOS. Nobody has a 100% test or even close to it. So when your doctor does an AdSense test, the accuracy of that test is just pretty low. But when we look at EMG and nerve conduction study, because we don't have a reference standard, no one can tell you how sensitive these studies are. Do they pick up 80% of people with TOS? Do they pick up 8% of people with neurogenic TOS? Nobody knows because you can't just select a group of people for your study and say, well, to me, they looked like they had neurogenic TOS. Until we have a reference standard, every study like that may be a small step forward, but it's unknown what sensitivity and specificity we have to rule in or rule out this disease. Now, insurance companies and some doctors who don't know a lot about TOS may say something you've heard often. We're gonna do an EMG because it'll rule in other causes of entrapment neuropathy. <clears throat> now that may be true. You can find a cubital tunnel syndrome where the ulnar nerve is trapped by the elbow or a carpal tunnel syndrome where the median nerve is squeezed. But you know what? Patients with TOS can have these diseases too. It doesn't rule out TOS. There's a syndrome called double crush or multiple crush where compression or tension on the brachial plexus causes the nerves downstream to act abnormally. But when you treat the brachial plexus compression, the peripheral nerves get better. So by itself, EMG does not rule out TOS. There's a test called the MAC test, uh, median antibrachial cutaneous nerve of the forearm along here. And uh, Dr. Dick Sanders has done a million surgeries in Colorado and Bennett Mechanic, a neurophysiologist who works with him, look at this very small peripheral nerve and say it's an early indicator of TOS. The number one, there's no real scientific reason for why that should be. It may be true, but again, because we don't have a reference standard, nobody knows, does this test miss many, many patients with neurogenic TOS? Besides that, there's no anatomic data from this. All right, a negative, this is one of my real big soapbox issues. A negative EMG and nerve conduction study proves the existence of this entity called disputed TOS. All right. This was the thing that I talk about in the late 1980s with Asa Wilborn arguing with David Roos, a surgeon in Colorado. Asa Wilborn was a well-respected neurologist. He did EMGs. He said, I've got a group of patients here who think they have neurogenic TOS. I examined them. I guess they do. And EMGs are negative. And therefore, these patients are faking it. Surgeons are faking it so they can make more money from doing surgery. Well, he didn't address any of the issues we've already discussed. Does EMG even find neurogenic TOS? And if so, how often? How much sensitivity does it have? So it's just he had an apparent obvious bias to me, and the logical argument is completely fallible. And one more thing I'll say, as I just said a minute ago, EMG and nerve construction study do not provide anatomic information, but we understand that there are all these anatomic variations and all these dynamic changes when you move your arms that cause TOS, the many forms of TOS. We know it's a space disease. That's why surgeons go in. A surgeon should never go in if there's not an anatomic cause for something. So surgeons go in because there is 
a, a series of items that can cause compression or tension on the brachial plexus, such as a cervical rib, such as a collarbone fracture, such as a scalene minimus muscle, such as the variant courses that the brachial plexus takes. So we wanna know that information. We've known in the past, before 1956, that there were many different types of this syndrome. That's still true today. The human body has not evolved that much. So we need anatomic information as a key part of diagnosing and treating TOS. And that is gonna be the end of the presentation. We are ready to take questions. I hope they're about EMG. I learned a good amount by studying this stuff. And we're gonna start taking questions. We got an early question today. Hi, Larry. I'm a massage therapist with clients suffering from TOS. Is there a definitive test to determine if TOS is functional or structural? One client, for example, suffers from costoclavicular interval. I think he means compression in the costoclavicular interval. How should that dictate my treatments? So number one, it's great to see massage therapists getting into this. I think that's a critical thing for a lot of patients we found get relief from this type of treatment along with their other treatments. Functional versus structural is a really great question and I think it's a great paradigm to look at this. So structural things, like you're born with the scalene minimus muscle, that's something you're just born with. It's a predisposition to getting the disease later. Usually it doesn't cause the disease by itself. I often use the analogy of the breast cancer gene that women have gotten tested for now for some time. And the women who have the gene uh, are at increased risk for breast cancer, but not all of them get it. There's obviously some superimposed radiation or chemical or biological event or events that occur, and they're at higher risk. So a patient with a cervical rib, if it's large enough, or a scalene minimus muscle, is at increased risk. And then later in life, they get some injury or overuse or recreational activity where they use their iPhone in weird positions, and all of a sudden they don't have enough space. So this structural abnormality has predisposed them and the functional change superimposed on it has caused enough compression or tension to create symptoms. So I think what you're saying is, are they separable or do they combine? And in most cases, it is a combined etiology. I think that's a great point to make. In terms of costoclavicular interval compression, uh, ultrasound is used a lot for this diagnosis of TOS, and it's blind in the costoclavicular interval. So people will use ultrasound to look at blood vessels. Raise your arms here, do 90 degrees, turn your arm out. And if they see a change in the arterial waveform or the venous waveform, they'll say, well, this is neurogenic TOS. But in fact, it's not. This was the test that Adson used in the 1920s. So you want to see directly those nerves and the surroundings of those nerves all along their course. I'm referring, of course, to the brachial plexus. And MRI does this the best, all right? So costoclavicular interval stenosis, you know, our imaging, we see what happens inside. What do the muscles look like? Uh, where do the nerves go? Do they follow a normal course? How much narrowing is there between your arms down and your arms up when you look at the costoclavicular interval? So it's easily seeable and knowable. And you might consider uh, talking with a patient, getting them imaging. That'll help to find how many things, if more than one, are going on in one patient. And the other thing I'd ask is if you have a local doc who's a TOS specialist who you like working with, help them out. You know, you'll learn from them and they'll learn from you and it's great for the patient. TOS is, uh, requires teamwork. Thank you for great questions. Brad Simpson. Hi, Brad. Thanks, Dr. Worden. I have a TOS diagnosis and positive EMG in the upper trunk brachial plexus. Some doctors tell me TOS just lower trunk is involved, but I understand anatomy can differ. Do you have thoughts on this? And um, it shouldn't surprise you when I say, yes, I do have thoughts on this. <clears throat> First of all, there are people who have written about the different variants of upper trunk versus lower trunk disease. A guy named R.L. Swank in 1944 may have published the first paper on that. That's all the detail I remember from that paper. But there are clearly abnormalities of the plexus that it can go through the scalene muscle or around the scalene muscle in the wrong direction. And these occur with C5 and C6 and the upper trunk, which are upper trunk disease. Also C7 is the middle trunk. The C8 and T1 nerve roots make up the lower trunk. They join to form it. 
They are the lowest. They're the most posterior. They can be affected by cervical ribs. They can get twisted and tightened around the first rib because they kind of form a pincer. They start independently. They go around the first rib and then they connect. Now the space between the first rib and this connection where they form the lower trunk, that can be a wide space or a narrow space. And if it's narrow, you can imagine you're pulling that little junction up against the bone all the time. <clears throat> so it's probably more common to get lower trunk disease. And it's classic, a patient with TOS, that they'll get C8 and T1 distribution along the medial side of the forearm into the pinky finger and half of the ring finger. And that's indicative of either the ulnar nerve, which is in the cubital tunnel, the ulnar nerve, or the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. Nonetheless, there is upper trunk disease, 100%. And um, this is a perfect example. You did a perfect segue for me. This is why imaging and knowing the anatomy helps separate out what kind of treatment you need. So some surgeons will say, I'm just going to go in there. It doesn't matter if you have upper trunk disease. I'm just going to take out everything. But um, surgery isn't typically done like that anymore. It's done by doing imaging and doing your clinical exam and knowing the disease and then doing specific surgery dedicated towards exactly what's wrong. And Brad, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Contact us on our webpage if you want more specific information. Uh, again, I'll remind everybody, we'll help with general questions. If you ask about your specific case, I will talk in generalities, but not your specific medical condition <coughs> because of all the privacy issues we want to respect. Not Gugapa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Dr. Worden, if a patient has scapular pain and dysfunction as the primary and most debilitating symptoms, would you address the scapula first or would you address the TOS? Sorry for the choppiness. My iPad is acting up. No trouble at all. Thank you for sticking to it. So scapular dysfunction is kind of a broad term. Could be winging of the scapula. Um, could be that at both arm positions, the arms down and the arms up, one scapula and the other are asymmetric. There are 17, mu <laughs> 17 muscles that attach to the scapula, and it's easy to imagine how they can get imbalanced, particularly if you've had an injury or if you're really one-handed dominant and you tend to use it more, maybe for things like tennis playing or something or baseball pitching. So Scapular dysfunction needs to be defined a little bit better. Now, with our study, we do measure the position of both scapulae, both first ribs, and both collarbones with the arms down and with the arms up. And we are looking for that asymmetry, either arm position comparing one side to the other, or asymmetry between how much each one moves when you raise your arms. There are six degrees of freedom in the scapula. It's just kind of a floating bone. It sits on a layer of muscle over the back of the chest wall. So it can slide and glide. It can rotate in three planes. And it's important to get that assessment. A good doc will be able to do an examination of your scapulae and do some muscle tests to see if he or she can cause winging or asymmetric motion. Uh, one of the tests is to stand against the wall and push. And then the doctor looks from behind and he or she will look for winging among other things. But it's absolutely worth having an experienced orthopedist or neurologist look at this because, as you're hinting, um, it may be a sign of other things going on. Now, your question is, is good on multiple levels. I want to address it correctly. If your scapulae are not positioned correctly, they will move the collarbone because the only place that the scapula actually attaches to the rest of the skeleton is through the collarbone. Scapula attaches out here. The collarbone attaches here. And so there's a whole lot of motion which generates position of the collarbone, motion of the scapula caused by these 17 muscles. If they're asymmetric, if you have the wrong posture, maybe if you have scoliosis, that will move the collarbone and the first rib doesn't move nearly that much. So you can bring the collarbone down too close to the first rib. And if it's in the right spot, it can press on the vein or the artery or the plexus. So asymmetric or ab <coughs> abnormal scapula can definitely result in TOS. But 
and this is a clever part of your question, if you have neurogenic TOS, and let's say you're compressing the nerves in this costal clavicular interval, you will tend to guard, you'll tend to keep that shoulder up a bit enough to release the pressure or tension. You'll tend to rotate forward. You'll tend to keep your neck to the side to release tension. So it may be that you have the primary cause of neurogenic TOS and your scapula is dysfunctioning as a result of guarding. So again, a good clinical examination and you know imaging helps a lot. But if you are in our scanner and we see severe compression of the plexus or tension on the plexus, combined with the right clinical picture should lead to good conservative therapy or consideration at least of surgery or maybe selective muscle blocks. And I hope that answers your question. Again, contact us for more. I'm going to remind people at this point, subscribe, hit the bell so that you get all our messages when we have a new video coming out. Comments help us a lot. I'll answer all of them. And um, likes, all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, help us out and help future patients out. All right, Herb. Brad has another question. If motor, der motor nerve damage won't recover with decompression, would this determine no recovery from pain with decompression as well? And that's not correct. I will respectfully <coughs> suggest that we, there are some papers in the literature about people who had surgery when they already had motor, um, uh, motor dysfunction, motor nerve fiber dysfunction. So they had hand muscle atrophy. If you cut off the nerve signal to the muscles, the muscle will first be hypersensitive, but then it will start wasting away. It'll atrophy or get smaller and get fatty degeneration. And so uh, there's a paper by um, Klein at uh, LSU in 1970, I think. And what they did was they actually measured, they did nerve conduction studies during surgery and they found C7 through T1 severe abnormalities of the nerve roots, which you can't do in an awake breathing person when you have no anesthesia and you don't have a surgical field. Very hard to do that, but they could do it during surgery and they found these abnormalities. And these patients also had wasting of the hand muscles. The vast majority of them did not get recovery of motor function. And we know this from other peripheral nerves. Now that doesn't change the pain part of it. So most patients, if they have the typical pain, numbness, tingling, burning, dysesthesias, anesthesia, the, the sensory symptoms of TOS, if they don't have motor symptoms or signs and they have a negative EMG, for example, then surgery, that's the time to consider it and not to wait until that motor nerve damage occurs. If you're already at that point, you have motor nerve damage, it's going to be a judgment call by your doctor. Uh, you probably can still get some pain relief, but that doesn't mean you'll recover much or all of the motor function. All right. Hope that answers a good question. Hey, there's this new guy, Brad, here. All right. Brad, we got to sit down for a beer sometime. We're spending way too much time together. Is a brachial plexus MRI good to see nerve damage in TOS? Uh, I'm going to give a gold star for this. So there is something called an MRN, MR neurography. Radiologists love it and some clinicians love it because it's the most beautiful pictures of just the nerves. Now, unfortunately, no one's really tested it and said, here's the sensitivity. If I have patients with an abnormal brachial plexus, and I do MR neurography on them, how many of those MR neurography studies will show abnormal brachial plexus? Let's say you have 100 patients with disease and the MRN neurography shows 80% of those as abnormal. That means your sensitivity is 80%. You've missed 20%. That's not very good by today's standards. So no one's done that study. And I don't know that they will because no one's going to take nerve biopsies of the brachial plexus. But the study has a lot of popularity because occasionally it shows something cool. And just by itself, it's the coolest thing. I can take pictures of the brachial plexus or the femoral nerve or whatever, and just make everything else in the picture black. That's part of how we do it. Now, the problem is that disease of the brachial plexus, besides we don't know how much damage has to occur in the brachial plexus before it's abnormal on an MRI study, okay? We need to know other things like is something compressing the brachial plexus? Remember that TOS 
is not a disease of the brachial plexus. It is a disease of all the structures around it that compress or stretch the brachial plexus. And that's where you get the problem. You can't fix the brachial plexus. What you're doing is you're fixing the other things around it. So if you do MR neurography and you get great pictures of the nerves and everything else is nulled and voided, then you have no idea what's compressing the brachial plexus. So you need other parts of the test. Our examination, the Nia Vista exam, includes pictures of the nerves and they're helpful. I'm, I've seen thousands of these now and I've seen those that look like MR neurograms and I've seen the ones that are the soft tissues around them all in the same patient on each side. See the brachial plexus and on other images, I see the soft tissues, the bones, the lung, the muscles. I see the arm position changes. And I can tell you, I see a lot of patients with severe compression of the brachial plexus or other abnormalities that cause pressure or tension on the brachial plexus. And I'm pretty sure it's correct because they go to surgery and they get better. And those nerves do not look abnormal on MR neurogram. So I know at least some patients, and I think it's more than half, um, can have normal looking brachial plexus if you just take those pictures. Those are not the critical pictures, in my opinion, in my experience. Thank you for that question. Benjamin Butler. Hi, Dr. Worden. Hi. Some surgeons are now using fat pad to wrap the brachial plexus after decompression to protect it, but couldn't that cause compression after surgery? All right. Um, I want to address this in an organized manner. So that's a really good question. Um, surgeons have actually been doing this for quite a while. Uh, Dr. Avery is a surgeon in San Francisco, been doing this 30 plus years. And 20 years ago, I watched him do surgery and he would sometimes do that, put fat pads around. He would also use a, um, a wrap. It's kind of a clear plastic wrap that people put around the plexus, which was supposed to help it glide and not adhere or fibrose to the tissue around it. Okay, I'm not sure how many studies there are on that. A lot of surgeons will do what's called an aggressive neurolysis. They take the outside of the plexus and they scrape off what they feel is fibrous tissue. Um, <clears throat> this brings up a very interesting topic for me, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, I don't think fat pads by themselves would cause compression. Fat is pretty malleable. And once you take out the first rib, if that's the type of procedure that was done, if you adequately decompress the hard floor of the thoracic outlet, and I think a little bit of fat wrapping is not going to make any difference. So I don't worry about that. Uh, also, I'm not telling surgeons what to do. Although some of them will tell me how to do my MRI, which I find fascinating, or tell me that the MRI has no value. I, I wouldn't walk into their operating room and say, use Seprafilm. No, 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 close with silk. So um, that's, you know, I'm not telling surgeons what to do. I, I would not worry about this uh, fat wrap. Uh, the film that people use, um, I don't know how strong the data is, so I can't comment one way or the other. In terms of neurolysis, is scraping the outside of the nerves because theoretically they're fibrotic and the nerve needs to expand or breathe. I'm not sure of the data on that. What I can tell you is that there is evidence in both animal and human studies that this kind of scarring occurs because you get this physical damage to the plexus. And inside the nerve roots, and inside these bundles of nerves, there's a soft filling layer called endoneurium, and there's perineurium, and there's epineurium. Don't worry about the anatomic terms. But what happens is there's a, the blood vessels get leaky if you um, compress these areas or if you compress the venous drainage. So if the veins don't drain easily and there's chronically mildly elevated venous pressure, there will be some leakage of the blood clotting proteins like fibrinogen into this space around the nerve fibers. And that can start an inflammatory cascade, which can result in fibrous tissue forming even on the microscopic level. So I don't know if doing the outside of the nerve, the neurolysis actually changes anything inside the nerve bundles, which is microscopic. I can also say that I've seen in post-op patients that come to me for review, I've seen brachial plexuses that are inflamed and angry looking which may be due to this manipulation, uh, the scraping, the aggressive neurolysis. So there's still lots of stuff left up in the air with this. Your original question, fat pad, I don't think it's a problem. 
as long as the mechanical decompression has been done correctly. All right. Thanks, Benjamin. Not Gugapa. Hi, Dr. Worden. Where is your closest location to Washington, D.C. for imaging? And if insurance will not cover, do you have self-pay rates? I feel the need to take my diagnosis into my own hands. So uh, thank you for the question. We do have partners not in Washington, D.C., but we are looking at expanding to that area. It would be a little while. Closest would be New York or Orlando, Florida. Uh, we do not work with insurance because in the end, insurance would just, um, you know, I tell this to all patients, insurance would deny it. They'd say, go get a chest X-ray or go get one big MRI of the chest and just tell us what you see. And um, so they would uh, deny it or make some substitute suggestion. And it would take six or eight weeks of me making phone calls to get it authorized. So it stalls the patient. Then we get the study done. When we send the bill to the insurance, they say, this is out of network. We're not covering this. Go get it from the patient. So in the end, it was a waste of my and my staff's time. It stalled the patient and patients end up paying in the end. So the way we handle it now is yes, there's an out-of-pocket. We give out a list of the CPT codes that we use. These are the codes insurance companies use for billing. And our patients submit that list of CPT codes and they get, uh, in many cases, reduction of their deductible, which you want if you're gonna go and get further treatment because once you meet that out-of-network deductible, insurance has to start paying where they get reimbursed a certain amount. Our study never turns out to be free, but patients do get a significant amount. My suggestion is this though, contact us through our website. We do consults for a low price. We will do a consult with you, get an idea of what you've had so far, which doctors you've seen, which tests you've had, and then get a 30,000 foot view and say, you know, is it likely you have TOS or is it likely something else? What are the next steps to take? And that's a, a good way to start. If patients refer themselves to my MRI, we'll do it. But I tend to want to help you get to the right kind of specialist for what's going on with you. And if that doc, he or she says, yeah, I think it's TOS, it clinically looks like that, then that's a good time to get the imaging. So reach out to us through the website, tosmri.com. Go, there's, we say contact us, several pages on the page. But if you go to the far right menu, TOS Education, there's a contact us button there and we respond right away, same day. So thanks. Herb, have we got another question? All right. So I wanna thank everybody for attending. We really appreciate when people pay attention, ask great questions. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to do some more reading because the questions you all are asking are getting tougher each time. And I really appreciate it. We ask you to do anything you can to help us spread the word. We're on social media. We like to pay it forward to other patients. We don't want patients searching neck pain in Google. We want them searching thoracic outlet syndrome. So comment, share stories with us. If you see a story about a baseball pitcher, pipe it into us and we'll make a blog post out of it. And again, thank you for viewing. Click the like button, subscribe, get your friends to come and see us. And uh, until we see you the next time, uh, this is Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy. Herb, our next talk coming up, do we have it set yet? Ah, uh, that's right. We have our next guest coming up is Dr. Ying Wei Lum from Johns Hopkins. So he's an assistant professor there and a uh, very good guy. We've had a couple of talks about TOS, very sharp guy, good surgeon from what I've heard. Uh, likes to utilize conservative therapy and he's not aggressive at jumping the surgery. Very interesting guy uh, at a great place. And uh, he's well worth listening to. The date is not set, but again, uh, if you hit subscribe and you hit the bell, you'll be notified. So Ying Wei Lum, Dr. Ying Wei Lum from Hopkins will be our next guest. And we're working on bringing that to you along with some other patient stories. Again, this is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. Contact us through my website, and uh, look at toseducation.org, who sponsors our videos. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.